The key to effective social media marketing is the exact same as the key to effective content marketing, providing value. Unfortunately, this is something that a huge number of businesses have absolutely no idea how to do, and that results in some very poorly managed social media. Take a look at the social media pages of your typical local B2B companies and you'll find that they tend to post some rather uninspiring and vapid statuses and posts. You'll see things like, find out why our content management solution is the best in the business. And order our EPOS system today and start serving your customers better. Well, this is nothing but blatant self-promotion and not even interesting self-promotion. You know, ask yourself, why would anyone be interested in following that? What are they gaining by reading your posts? One of the single most important questions to ask when looking at your social media or your content is, would you read it? If not, then you need to do something to make it more interesting. This means your social media now needs to provide some kind of purpose for the viewer. It should be interesting, it should be entertaining, and it should be useful or it should be inspiring. Inspiring social media can work particularly well. Take a look at Instagram and you'll find lots of accounts filled with people wearing stunning clothes, posing to show off their rippling muscles, or even just showing off their wealthy lifestyle. Then there are the travel accounts with lots of pictures of beautiful mountain ranges and sunsets. Why did these work? Well, because people see those channels and feel inspired. They live vicariously through them and enjoy daydreaming about having a life like that. They know that if they follow that account, they'll be shown many more similarly inspiring posts and they continue to live the dream. And guess what? When you then promote a piece of clothing or an ebook on how to get fit, they listen. Examples of popular Facebook pages are things like IFL Science, which posts links to articles with some really eye-catching titles and gets tons of likes and tons of shares as a result. The best Twitter accounts are ones run by personal brands that let fans feel as though they're really getting to know them with insights into their daily routines, with jokes or with insider tips. Want to make a splash on Pinterest? Then how about creating a board to show off life hacks or to demonstrate great outfit choices or workout inspiration? The aim again is to provide real value and the way to know if you're doing this well is to ask yourself, would people be disappointed if you stopped posting to your account? Not just your blog, but your social media channels. Your social media needs to be able to stand on its own two feet and be something people enjoy in its own right. That's how you gain followers and shares and it's how you get people to visit your site and buy your products. Once again, from there, the key is to post regularly and to be consistently on topic. Don't create a blog on fitness, but continuously post on social media about your love of gardening or people will get tired and leave. How frequently should this be? Well, ideally, the more frequently you post, the better. Several times a day is generally recommended, especially since the likes of Facebook will only show each post to a small percentage of your followers. Now let's look at some more tips for getting your social media right. One thing you might be wondering is how you can provide this kind of entertaining, engaging value when you run a website about life insurance. You know, what could you possibly do on Instagram or Pinterest that would be appropriate? Well, the answer is not to think about the service directly, but rather about the value proposition and the audience. Your aim is to post things that will be interesting to the same demographic and will be relevant, but this doesn't have to mean you only ever post directly about life insurance. One example of this might be to make an Instagram account about all the ways to spend time with your family and take care of them as a mum and dad. This has a very broad appeal, but it's also directly relevant to life insurance because, after all, life insurance is all about looking after your family once you're gone. 
people who want to be better mums and dads can follow your Instagram, which will be in the same spirit as your business. And once you have their ear, you can recommend Life Insurance Policy X. Likewise, you could do something similar with a Pinterest account. Now, how about making all this about ways to save money as a family? You could show money-saving hacks, budgeting tips, etc. And use that to promote your life insurance as the best financial option or your website as the best place to learn about life insurance. Another important tip is to think about your audience and who they are. If you want people to share your posts, and this is the best way to ensure they reach the maximum number of people, then you need to be sure you're targeting your audience specifically. This is important, seeing as trying to reach too wide an audience will ultimately mean that you don't specifically appeal to anyone. This is the mistake a lot of people make with their posts on how to get abs. They think that they need to appeal to everyone and thus they end up with very safe and very generic content. But content performs best when it's targeting specifically at a particular type of person. This all relates to the psychology of sharing. Why do we ever share content? Well, there are two simple reasons, to express ourselves or to communicate. We communicate by sharing things that we think will appeal to someone we know. If you see a post on how working from home turns your brain to mush, then you're going to share that with your friend Bill who works from home as a cheeky joke, as a way to help them work from home better, or perhaps just a way to show that you're thinking of them. If you work from home yourself, then you might post it to express how you feel about working from home and to help others understand you better. But notice that in both scenarios, the post only works because it applies so specifically to people who work from home. While being very specific might appear to exclude potential customers, it makes it much easier for you to market to a particular type of person who is likely to buy from you. And to make this work, you need to spend some time profiling what that person is like. How old are they? What gender are they? What are their hobbies? What websites do they spend time on? You'll see why this is even more important shortly. Once you've decided how you're going to provide value through sharing your blog posts or by posting images, you'll then need to make sure you have a strong brand that will have some good visibility and tie your social media channels neatly to your website. It's important that when someone sees a post from you, they know it's from the same website that they saw the other day. So make sure you have a good logo and use that as your profile picture or your cover image on each account. Likewise, use the same name wherever possible. Another tip is to integrate your social media and your website as closely as possible. It'll take a while to build up momentum on your social media, but one thing that you can do to help that along is to add social media buttons to your website so that people can check out your Facebook page directly from your website. Ideally, you'll gain new followers each time someone goes to your website. That way, they'll be more likely to see your future posts and share them, bringing in yet more visitors who can subsequently become followers. Also important is simply to ask people to follow you on social media. This is particularly effective in videos, so if you have a YouTube channel, then don't be shy to simply ask the people watching to follow you on Twitter and give them some good reasons to do so. Similarly, at the end of a blog post, why not just ask your readers to share the post with their friends using the handy sharing buttons that you provide? It's also a good idea to integrate your various different posts to save time and to ensure that you fill each channel with as much content as possible. For example, you can make it so that you post all your tweets on your Facebook page or that each new YouTube video is automatically shared on Twitter. Don't forget that social media is still primarily a communication tool. 
one of the best ways to ensure people are engaged with you is to actually talk with them and to do something as simple as just following people or liking their pictures. If you've ever used Instagram, then you'll be familiar with how pleasing it is that someone has started following you, especially if they look like a professional brand. Likewise, it's great when they comment and say, nice pick. This will motivate you to check out their channel and, in many cases, to follow it. So, just spend some time posting and, of course, be sure to actually respond to people. Running contests and surveying your audience can also be a very good way to increase engagement and to get a better idea of what your followers want to see from you. A good example of a contest is to award a follower with a free gift if you get over X number of likes. This can help you to build more shares and likes as well as being a great way to thank your fans. Now it's time to look at one of the biggest pillars of internet marketing of all, SEO. SEO is search engine optimization, and this basically means that you're trying to get your website to show up in the search results. Of course, you're not going to be able to show up high in every search result, so this is where keywords and targeting come in. A keyword is essentially a word or phrase that people are going to search in order to find your site. When people go shopping online, they'll almost always start with Google. And when they start with Google, they will begin by searching for the thing that they want. It very often, this will mean that they search for something like buy hats online. If you can target that precise phrase so that your page is the top result, you will not only be able to reach the right demographic, but you'll be able to target them at the precise moment they're actually planning on buying something. The same thing happens when someone looks for information. They might search for how to lose weight after Christmas, or they might search for fitness articles. Again, you can bring more people to your site and that way hopefully create more loyal followers simply by making sure your pages come up as top results for those terms. So SEO has the huge advantage of being highly targeted and allowing you to reach anyone rather than just people who are your followers or who are part of the same network as your followers. The only problem is that SEO is also arguably more complicated than the other forms of marketing we've looked at so far. It's never guaranteed. That is to say you can spend years doing SEO or pay the very biggest SEO service in the world and still not see any improvements. Let's take a look at why that is and how to give yourself the best chance of success. In order to get to the top of Google, the aim is to try and understand how Google works, how Google decides which sites are worthwhile and how you can manipulate those factors in order to move your site to the top. Google works using spiders or robots. These are small programs that search the web by following from one link to the next. Each time they find a new website, they add it to a giant index and will assess the subject matter and the quality of the site by looking at who is linking to the page, how the page is laid out and what the subject of the content appears to be. If we knew precisely how Google's algorithm worked, then we could get to the top of the search results with guaranteed certainty. As we don't know this though, all we can do is make educated guesses and hope that these get us to the top of Google. When Google first became the dominant search engine, the algorithm was fairly straightforward and was generally quite well understood by marketers. Back then we knew that Google found sites by following links on sites already in the index. Google thought of a link as testimony. The more people link to your site, the better your site must be. Google attempted to match search terms with the content on your pages. If you repeated the same phrase often enough, you stood a better chance of ranking for that term. Back then, it was easy enough to manipulate Google into doing your bidding. All you had to do was to create a website with lots and lots of content, repeat the same keywords over and over again, and get lots of other sites to link to you. 
It was literally a matter of whoever worked the fastest could get to the top of Google the quickest. Unfortunately, though, this also led to some very bad practices. People would stuff keywords into their text, repeating the same few phrases over and over again. People would pay for links. People would steal content and spin it, you know, swap words for synonyms, and generally Google's results started to become dominated by spam. So Google clamped down and introduced some smarter rules and algorithms. These updates to its system were known as Penguin and Panda and really shook up the internet marketing community. Now Google is much smarter when it comes to looking for content and now values quality over quantity to a large degree. A few examples of the changes. First off, Google will now penalize websites for keyword stuffing. A density of 1 to 2 percent is generally recommended. Google now prefers long-form content and will reward it. Google will penalize sites that associate with spam sites. Low-quality links are worthless. Links from established authorities mean much more. A single link from Harvard is worth a million links from spam sites. Google now understands synonyms and related terms and will look for you to have written around a subject. Google penalizes links that are from sites that aren't related to yours. Google clamps down hard on paid links. Google clamps down hard on stolen or reworked content. Google can now monitor how long people spend on a website or page. If your visitors are only staying for a second before leaving, Google will take this to mean that your site doesn't offer any real value and you will be penalized. This sudden change resulted in a lot of sites being removed from Google altogether, which badly hurt many businesses. As you can imagine, this caused quite a lot of outcry. But what's important to remember is that website owners are not the customers Google is catering to. Google is catering to users who want to use Google in order to find high quality content. Thus, Google's main and only objective is to ensure that the content it shares is relevant and interesting to the people searching for it. So, what's the best way to handle good SEO? Simple. Make sure you are providing great, relevant content. When you do this, you are aligning yourself with Google's goals. Therefore, every change Google makes will ultimately help more people to find your site. Meanwhile, the sites that try to spam Google or trick it will only be damaged each time that Google has an update. So, with all that said, how do you go about carrying out SEO for your site in this day and age? We'll cover that in part two. With what we covered in the last video, you may be wondering whether it really is possible to get your site ranked now. How do you go about carrying out SEO for your site in this day and age? Well, let's take a look at some modern SEO practices. The first thing to do is to fill your site with as much relevant content as possible. Notice how SEO and content marketing naturally go hand in hand already? Again, this content should be long form, at least occasionally, and should contain links to other sites. Again, the same things that make your content high quality for your readers are the things that Google wants to see. Do some keyword research to find what people are searching for and what you should try to target to get the ideal traffic to your site. You can find the volume of people searching for specific terms by using Google's Keyword Planner. Come here to adwords.google.com forward slash keyword planner and then sign in using your Google ID. It's all very straightforward. Try to make sure that the terms you search for aren't too competitive, however. Otherwise, you can end up going against too many other sites and giving yourself an impossible task. As mentioned earlier, Google just doesn't like you to keep repeating the same key phrase over and over. Instead, 
The objective is to lace it into the content a few times as naturally as possible while also including synonyms and related terminology. This should happen naturally and it should never distract the reader. From here you can go about building links from high quality relevant sites. These are certain sites that Google already trusts and you can spot these by looking at which ones are already at the top of Google and which ones are featured in Google News. Google also likes big recognized brands and it likes .edu and .org domains. While it might be hard to get links from those sites, you can think of this a bit like degrees of separation. In other words, if you can't get a link from Harvard University, look for a site that does have a link from Harvard and see if you can't get a link from them. One of the best strategies you can use to build links is something called guest posting. Here you're essentially going to contact big blogs and offer to write content for them for free. This content needs to be relevant and high quality so they will be tempted to go ahead and publish it. Rather than charging for your writing, what you then do is make it part of the deal that you will get a link back to your website within the body of the text. One way to avoid going head to head with the biggest players in your niche is to focus on local SEO. Local SEO is simply SEO that places local keywords front and center. So if you live in Santa Monica and you run a hairdresser, then you would try to rank for Santa Monica hairdresser and you would build links from other local companies. It's much easier to become number one for a specific search term like this. Even if you're running an international business, it can be a good idea to start local and then branch out once you've built a local momentum. Lastly, a few things that can help to keep you in Google's good books. Avoid anything that looks spammy or manipulative. Try to avoid patterns and encourage your visitors to share your links online. That's what Google really likes to see, sites with lots of links on the strength of their quality. One way to do this is to write link bait. This is content that is so useful, so interesting or so shocking that other people want to link to it and include it in their debates or share it with friends. When creating your links, avoid trying to use only your keywords in the anchor text. Sometimes the best anchor is just click here or this article. Again, it looks more organic and natural and means Google won't think that you're paying for your links. Now, don't try and trick Google. Just create high quality content for your readers while keeping Google's algorithms in the back of your mind.